Well, the lady that suggested this is leaving. <laughs> uh, I like that recommendation, that maybe first couple of minutes of our class, to go over a couple of verses that is important to know when we're trying to teach somebody the gospel. And so, tonight I want to think about the authority of God, of Christ, the Word. Before we can establish uh, faith, we need to respect the Bible for what it is. And so, when, God, when Christ gave the Great Commission to his apostles, there in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, Matthew 18, that's not right, 28, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke unto them saying, all power, your version might say authority, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'll be with you always, even unto, to, until the end of the world. Here, Christ is pointing to the gospel, his teaching, his doctrine. That's what is to be taught. That will guide people into a relationship with the Father and the Son because of hearing and believing and being baptized. And so, use Matthew 18 through 20 to show that Christ instills the importance of listening to the Word. And then I want us to look at John chapter 4. Uh, 14, John 14, 23 and 24. John thir uh, 14, verse 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Here Christ is establishing his relationship with the Father, who sent him, whose words he speaks. Therefore, they have the authority. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus told us in respect to our relationship to him. So maybe this can, will begin uh, adding to our knowledge scriptures that we can use to, to teach people. Got to begin somewhere. Begin by showing them the authority of Christ. And that will help them to learn and to recognize and, and yield to them. Now turn to Acts 13, verse 22. Today, tonight in the, in the life of David, I want us to think about the very idea that he's called a man after God's heart. If you look at the life of David, you might wonder, how in the world could he be titled this way? Look at all that he did. Look at all the sins. 
But I believe it's important to see here, even an apostle in the Christian age, how David was looked at. Long after he lived out, long after he sinned and, and was the king of Israel, look how Paul spoke of him here in Acts 13, verse 22. Here, Paul is on his first missionary journey, and he's talking about Jewish history, and here's how he relates to David. And when he had removed him, let me add that, when God removed Saul, okay, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. And said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel 13. As you can see from our study of David and Goliath, and a lot of what we're going to refer to is in 1 Samuel or 1 Kings or 1 Chronicles. All those used to be one book altogether. But now we see them separated in the first and second Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. Now here in first Samuel, Saul has sinned. What was Saul commanded to do in regards to the Amalekites? Destroy them. Animals, people, everybody. Seems cruel, doesn't it? Well, when they came to the land of promise, what were they told to do? Drive the Canaanites out. Kill them. Get them out of your, among you. God was knowing if they remain, they will, let's use the word contaminate. They'll influence you and weaken you and you'll fall down to worship idols. And he knew if he could, if the people would get rid of that influ evil influence, they had a better chance of staying faithful to God. Uh, verse 14. Now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul had good intentions. He's bringing those back to, to offer sacrifices. Uzzah had good intentions when he raised his hand to, to steady the ark that was on the cart, the ark of the covenant. And because he was not a Levite, what happened? died right there on the spot. And we've talked about that before. Because of David not understanding how to transport the ark, Uzzah paid the price. Well, you know, we think about all some of the accomplishments of David. All right, we talked about him slaying the king, excuse me, <coughs> slaying the giant, Goliath, there in 1 Samuel 17. But he couldn't slay within him evil desires and the desire to take another man's life. So he committed adultery and resorted to murder. You know, he showed great mercy, <coughs> sympathy, to Saul's household after Saul ended up dying. But he ordered the death of a man. So one side, he's got compassion, the other side, <coughs> heartless. You know, as a king, he enforced the obedience of God's law. <clears throat> but himself, he grossly violated that law himself. So, doesn't seem like he's a consistent individual, does it? 
And so, given these complexities and the sins of David's, David, you might ask the question, how could he be called a man after God's own heart? Somebody tell me, what does it mean to be after somebody's heart? life. You're doing that which is in favor of God's heart. You're seeking to please Him. You, you're desiring to, to do what He says. If I seek after someone's heart, I'm going to win them over. David, after God's own heart, is an individual who obeys, who's ready. Does it mean he's going to be perfect? Anybody without sin, raise your hand. Whoops. None of us are sinless. So why wonder about David? You know? Look at some of the accomplishments of David. You know? When he became king, he enacted several reforms to promote and perpetuate the law of Moses. You go to 2 Samuel 6. Verses 1 through 7, and read about these things. Uh, even though he did it wrong, he finally was able to bring the ark to Jerusalem, to the capital, which he uh, made the capital. We don't even know how he captured Jerusalem. <coughs> it's never told. But he, he has possession of it. And he's brought that ark to a new tent to be a new tabernacle like the one similar to the one that was in the wilderness. Uh, and in this time he dedicated ceremonies and it showed his heart toward God, his humbleness. Several things he also did. He appointed priests, Second Samuel 8, verse 17. Concerning being a military man, he had great success, and that this characterized his reign as king, Second Samuel 8, verses 1 through 18. Think of all that he conquered. The Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the border of Israel was stretched to a greater realm, all because of David. <clears throat> it says in 2 Samuel 8, 14, that God preserved David wherever he went. It says in 2 Samuel 8, verse 15, that David reigned over all of Israel. He was truly the king. But what about his sins? Well, we know about his adultery. Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, David, uh, you look at his humility, and whenever he was confronted with his sin, uh, there was never, well, with Nathan, and there was not never any excuses or denial. Uh, you know, he was repentant, and he admitted you know, his sin. That's a big lesson. Somebody seeking the heart of another is open for uh, being pointed out, corrected, and it will yield. Yes, David doesn't debate, doesn't argue. He didn't offer an excuse like you say. He repented right there. That's a good point. He was, uh, when he was convicted, he repented. It was only God's mercy that spared David. Yet, look what his sins did. What happened to the son that was brought through his union with Bathsheba? He died. Didn't get killed. He died of sickness. Uh, even David had to watch the death of over his own sons, Nah, uh, uh, Ammon, Absalom, uh, Jonathan died in battle. You know, 
of all the people I wanted to, to live through all that, Jonathan. <laughs> but, but he died because of Saul. And so, and also he saw numerous rebellions in his kingdom against him. And so when we hear the phrase, a man after God's own heart, many people have trouble putting that into place because of the gross sins that marred David's life and his history. Turn to Psalms 81. Psalms 81, verse 20. Well, there's not an 81, 20. That's what I get for doing it quick. <laughs> Huh? Uh, let's keep going. Uh, one of the one of the things David failed at out was when he called for a census, a counting of the people. He didn't have that right. What was God's reaction? He sent a pestilence, a plague, and 70,000 died. Well, God gave him a choice. <clears throat> with what? God gave him a choice between three things, and David had to choose which one. And he chose a pestilence? Mm -hmm. Well, why did God punish the people? David defends the people. He says, I did them because of his census. He says, I did the wicked thing. He went against God's will. He says, punish me. Don't punish the people. There in uh, well, he said this, 2 Samuel 24, 17. Uh, he said, I've done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? David had a hard time making the connection. All right? What did the people request? Give us a king. And when the king did pagan things, the people suffered. What chapter was that in? 24, 17. 2 Second Samuel, Samuel 24, 17. He had a difficult time seeing the connection between what he did and what the people had done. Because they had requested a king, they were punished. Yeah, see, he had a choice between uh, seven years of famine uh, or flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue you or three days pestilence. <clears throat> Well, and what did he do? He chose the pestilence because he figured, um, he said, um, uh, let's see. It uh, said, and David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So in his repentance... God's day that uh, removed the death angel, 2 Samuel 24, 18. Let's talk about some of the reasons why or we can learn from David in, in being called the man after God's own heart. Why could he come to that point and, and do better than other kings? Well, number one, because of his family, his background. Nason was the first prince of Judas, Numbers 2, verse 3. That was his uncle, I think. Salmon married Rahab, and uh, Rahab came to be in the lineage of Christ. Boaz, Ruth, and Jesse. Jesse was 
the father of David. Uh, we don't know the mother's name, but he speaks of his mother. I think Psalm 86, verse 116. No. Where are these coming from? Yes, well, anyway, he speaks of his mother as the handmaid of Jehovah. So he respects her. Maybe it's 8616. Yes, verse 16. I put an extra one. O turn unto me, and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant, and save the son of thy handmaid. So he's mentioning his mother. Children that have a mother that loves them and disciplines them and, and guides them is a great blessing. So David remembers his mother and how he she helped him. Uh, so he came from a great family, a good a good grounding. You know, think about Timothy and his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. Brought him up in the in, in the knowledge of God's word. When you have that background, when you have that foundation, you have a better chance of, of turning out right. Number two. He learned to correct his errors that Jennifer was talking about. He was ready when he was convicted. Uh, someone brought it out. He repented. And we need to always learn to repent. You know, criticism isn't always bad. When, when somebody points out an error in our life, what are they trying to do? Make you look bad and them look better? That's kind of what we think sometimes. Uh, but when someone honestly takes the time and cares about us and points out something we need that we should think about and correct, they're doing us an honor. They're doing us a good deed. It's so, called con constructive criticism. Constructive criticism, that's right. Uh, we need to be, uh, thirdly, open to inspection. God's all-seeing eye looks at us. You ever been able to hide? You ever been able to, to, to uh, think no one knows what I'm doing? No. First uh, Samuel 16, verse 7, remember? There in the, the choosing of a king, uh, God says, don't look on the outward appearance. God looks on the inward man. God can see and he knows us. He, we should realize we're open to his inspection all the time. So don't try to hide. Don't make excuses. Don't blame someone else. You know. Fourthly, be obligated to God and be diligent to fulfill His law. Keep your heart right every moment. Now, did David fault? Did he make faults? Did he sin? Yeah. But he did something about it. He changed. He grew. He, he looked to please God. That's, that's why we have that record David was after God's own heart. Number five. God never leaves himself without resource. All right? Saul did wrong. God said, Saul, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you. You're not going to be sitting on the throne. Your, 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 your uh, crown. crown is going to be taken from you. But there's little David being prepared in the, in the taking care of the sheep. Uh, David was called a better man, a better neighbor, and he was being prepared, even though he didn't realize it. You know, in our society, we think, and we fret about things, you know. Uh, you ever hear anybody talk about this wicked generation? <clears throat> 
or you know there's going to be a financial collapse you know get, there's there's the, this governmental corruption that's going on how many different times through American history that's happened people are going to be asking what are we going to eat what are we going to wear how am I going to live people are fretting about all things but what's important Realize that God is in control. Don't forget that basic truth. God is in charge, and He's in control, and He knows what we need. Do we have the faith to trust Him? Don't depend on your own strength. Seek God's help. And lastly, you know David, who He what represented. He was a type of Christ. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 34. <clears throat> Isaiah Ezekiel. Isaiah Jeremiah Ezekiel. <laughs> 20, 34 verse 23. What first or chapter? Ezekiel 34, verse 23 through 25. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. 2 Samuel 7, 12. Second Samuel 7, verse 12. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with your fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Now go to Acts 2.30. Here on the day of Pentecost. He speaks of David. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Here we... We're seeing how God, through David, came to seed. Christ is that one seed. Hebrews 4.15 says, We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's talking about Jesus Christ. Because of Him, we can come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. A penitent king was used by God to foreshadow a perfect Savior. We might have sin in our lives, but we can overcome that sin through repentance and a, determined, a determination not to do it again. We learn from our lessons and we grow spiritually <clears throat> and we mature in our faith. What you once was weak at, you can overcome. You don't have to, to uh, worry about it any longer because you, of what you've learned in Christ Jesus. These things that David points to 
as sovereign, as king. And even though he made many mistakes, many sinned, his willing heart to hear, to change, to repent, and live better. Think about his life afterward. And all the accolades and all the, the statements about king. I was, I was reading, and it says, of all the people in, in the Old Testament, Moses, Joseph, all of them, David is spoke of more than all of those. There's a point uh, to bring up about David. Well, I'm finished a little early. Anybody have any comments or questions? All right. You're dismissed. <laughs>